The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. The Investment Fix Podcast. Tune in today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai, hoki mai, ki a The Fold, e mihi ne ko Duncan Grieve tokuing oa. There's this, there's this newsletter I subscribe to. Um, oh, it's kind of like a new, a new publication that's mainly delivered by email called Puck. And I love it. It's like X Vanity Fair. It's got this real kind of buzzy voice to it. But, but every week the editor goes, it was another fantastic week on Puck. And I'm like, come on, man. They can't all be fantastic weeks. And I feel like I've totally become this hack who's like, oh, this is a really good one. I mean, look. Look, I like my own podcast, sue me, but this is a real good one, okay? Uh, this is this dude, Rex Woodbury, who's, it's my first ever podcast with a, a non-New Zealand subject, but I think it's, you, you'll see why, why I did it. Um, he's, he's a, he writes a newsletter called Digital Native, he's a venture capitalist who lives in New York City, he's a millennial cusping to Gen Z and is really obsessed with Gen Z as a kind of a window into the future Um, and just generally is this person who over the nine months that I've been reading his weekly newsletter is someone who I've come to really rely on as as the most kind of cogent and uh, kind of clear-eyed explainer of the future that's I don't feel like that's too too broad a way of putting it. Like he basically seems to he because it, his kind of job is to to look into the future and, and and invest accordingly, and with a particular lens on the intersection of technology and culture, he just seems to understand things about the way that the world is evolving that are quite profound insights. Certainly, they read that way to me. But more than that, and this is where we start, he's just like super optimistic about um, where we're heading and where technology is heading. And I'm very guilty of this. I'm sure a lot of my listeners are too. Like it's it's quite easy to sort of feel like the world is dystopian, like it's sort of inevitably tumbling downhill and um, technology is, is playing an outsized role in that. And I, I'm not saying that, you know, as with most things, it's, it's not column A or column B, it's somewhere in between. But because Rex... He just has this very um, plausible way of explaining the future that that feels quite quite exciting and, and vibey, and so I reached out to him like a couple months ago, and he he agreed to do this interview uh, on on the proviso that rather than talk about his entire oeuvre, we talk about uh, Gen Z and and what's coming there because I think at the time it was he was really really drilling into that. And because of that, and in the spirit of a kind of nothing about us without us, I brought along a real life Gen Z person, which is Lucy Blackiston, uh, who has been a guest on The Fold and is certainly around the spinoff a lot. She runs Shit You Should Care About, which is this, basically it's, I don't know how you describe it, it's a media platform, it's an online community, it's a bunch of things, but it's got this enormous global audience and she feels like she in her life and vision embodies a lot of what Rex writes about. And also she introduced me to Rex's work and we've ended up talking a lot about it um, over the past year or so. Uh, so it's it's the three of us talking a lot about what's coming down the pipe. We make reference to the uh, merger of RNZ and TVNZ, believe it or not, and um, particularly about the way that the rise of platforms like TikTok and Be Real and so on are, are impacting the, the sort of more established 2010s internet, the, the Googles and Facebooks of the world. It's a pretty broad-ranging conversation. It gets into the weeds a little bit, as T.I. here just, just said off mic. But, um, but I think it's also, I don't know, it's, it feels like to me... What I wanted from this is exactly what I got, which is a, a sort of view into what's coming down to the down the pipe. But everyone listening to this has a, an interest manifestly in figuring out what that means for for media, for themselves, for their businesses, for their organisations. And uh, Rex is about as good a person as I've ever heard on the planet at explaining that. So that's enough for me. Let's get into it. This is Rex Woodbury from Digital Native and Index Ventures on the fold. 
Kia ora and welcome to the fold, Rex Woodbury. This is this is so exciting to me, and uh, and I'm very happy to have uh, Lucy Blackiston here with us. So yeah, uh, great to have you on here, Rex. No, no, wonderful to be here. I mean, uh, it sounds like we have many, many interests in common, and so I'm excited to dive into them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the the reason that we're talking at all is because you've got this this weekly newsletter called Digital Native, and uh, you know, Lucy first discovered it as 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 is very predictable, and um, but it's become <laughs> this kind of borderline obsession of both of ours. But that's like very much not your day job. This is a sort of side hustle to keep you fresh is what, is what yes, it feels yes. like. So <laughs> who are you and how did you become you is my opening question. Well, that's a, a deep opening question. Oh, yeah. am I? I'm, oh, not yeah. sure, I'm not sure I have that figured out yet, um, <laughs> but I can give you the, the sort of LinkedIn answer or resume answer. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you both for reading. First of all, I mean, uh, sometimes sending out a, a newsletter into the void feels very, um, Lonely. You, know, you, you don't get much lonely. And I was going to say my dad's the, the loyal responder every <laughs> Wednesday where, you know, he reads it, but now I know there are at least three readers out there. <laughs> um, so I appreciate that. And, and no, I'm, ch- I'm excited to chat about these things. I mean, it is uh, definitely separate from my day job, which is I'm a partner at Index Ventures. We're a global venture capital firm. Um, but I, I spend most of my time doing consumer investing and investing around a lot of the themes that I write about in Digital Native. So it is related. Um, you know, I think it's a, a helpful way for me to synthesize a lot of the different theses that I'm working on or the different worldviews that I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around. It's a good forcing function each week to um, put my thoughts out on paper and for better or worse, have a paper trail of all of my right and wrong, um, you know, predictions over the last few years. So, I mean, and one of the things that I, I like most about it is that it has this really like an optimistic tone about both the present and the, the sort of way the future's evolving into view and being built out. And that is very atypical, uh, you know, of, of this moment. I think a lot of media that is, you know, fundamentally about the internet, which feels like obviously very much a focus of, of digital native, I've absolutely been guilty of this, slides into something close to despair, uh, because you're sort of so consumed with some of these big storylines, whereas you still seem to have something that reminds me almost of the very early optimism of, of the, the first kind of waves of the internet, which is just a super attractive thing to read. What, what is it about the, the sort of possibilities and the culture of the, the sort of coming internet that, that, that still excites you? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think about technology the same way I think about business and capitalism. So so earlier in my career, way back in a prior life, I worked in impact investing. So sort of investing in, in socially impactful companies and that were sort of quote unquote double bottom line. Um, you know, they were for profit, but also had some sort of measurable social impact. Um, and Bono, who I didn't expect to name drop on this podcast, the, the U2 singer Bono was actually one of the one of the co-founders of, of that fund. It's called the Rise Fund. Um, and he would often say um, capitalism isn't moral or a, or immoral. It's amoral. And it's up to us to redirect it in the right way. That's that's productive. But it also happens to be the most creative and incredible invention for improving humanity that we have. Um, and I feel that same way about technology, where I think a lot of the headlines around technology focus on the negative. Um, there's always going to be a negative. There are definitely positive and negative externalities to all of the innovations and startups that we talk about. Um, but I also, you know, am an optimist. Um, I think life is more fun when you think about the positive, and certainly you need to design mechanisms to um, address the negative, and you have to be aware of them. And we can't gloss over them, but. Um, there's so much that is still being built in in the tech world and so many problems that are for the first time being addressed that, you know, whether it's AI, VR, AR down the road, um, even just people still coming online and um, being connected through social media, um, as well as, you know, commerce coming online and really financial technology still being um, a new, new sort of penetration of, of the world's markets. I mean, there are so many exciting things to talk about. And, um, you know, my my privilege is to get to spend time meeting the people who are designing the companies and, and building the products that are going to change all those different sectors. And I feel like that naturally leads us into what, what you know, the, the, the bulk of what we're going to talk about. And that, 
you know, when I first reached out, you you agreed to do it on the basis that we talk more narrowly about Gen Z. And you kind of seem to you seem to have like this this sort of thesis of, about Gen Z, its sort of behavioral traits, its values, the way that it's kind of you know evolving, and that it feels like it's it's very impactful on the culture. And ultimately, on some level, that speaks to your day job. You are investing, effectively placing bets that that, that will continue and grow. Uh, and and honestly, as as someone who's become really good friends with, with Lucy and just watches the way she operates, I, I kind of see that mirrored in the way that she sort of instinctively moves through these spaces too. Well, um, I'm going to have to put Lucy on the spot in a minute because I'm curious what I can learn from her behaviors as well too. Well, there's a lot you can see from my behavior that I wouldn't recommend learning. I also just think it's hilarious the way that Duncan referred to Gen Z as like, it's it's this thing, like, instead of a Gen Z as a people, it's like, and it does this and it does this and it's this phenomenon, even though he knows me really well and actually I'm just a human. Um, to finish Duncan's question, first of all, are you Gen Z or are you, because you have a lot of takes. You know, I think I'm a, a closeted millennial where I'm actually a proud millennial, so yeah. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I'm definitely close to the border um, but I do think I'm firmly in the millennial camp. And I actually was going to start by saying that, you know, I think uh, when I, I write about Gen Z or talk about Gen Z, I think um, it certainly encompasses more than sort of the broad or the narrow rather definition of, you know, who, who knows what it is, but call it, you know, 13 to 23 year olds or whatever the age range is. I think it it bleeds into some of millennials. It bleeds into some of, some of Gen Alpha who are the generation after Gen Z. But um you know, I think it's more this idea of the name of, of the newsletter is Digital Native. And so I think it's more this idea that these generations in this cohort of people, maybe they're 32 and under or people who grew up in middle school and high school with, with a smartphone or grew up with Instagram and Snapchat and YouTube. Um, I think there's this huge divide between that generation of digital natives or um, near digital natives and people from a more analog era who remember a lot of uh, you know, things like uh, landlines or VCRs or name the technology that your teenager would look at you quizzically about. Um, but I think it, it captures this broader set of people. And I like to think I'm one of those, but um, also maybe because I'm a little bit older, um, I can, you know, look look back and uh, observe some of the younger behaviors that I find fascinating as well. And we're blessed to have you, like, looking at us, helping us make <laughs> sense of how we navigate the world as well. I mean, I read Digital Native and I feel like, Every time I read, I understand something a little bit better about me, who I am like a classic Gen Z. I dress like one. I speak like one. I use TikTok <laughs> like one. But it's nice to hear that you find Gen Z fascinating from sort of the outside, but also kind of the inside. And is it just yeah. is it just that we've grown up in this time of, you know, I've had an iPhone since I was probably 16, or is it more our media consumption, or what is it that you find so fascinating, if that's a word that you'd use. Yeah, I mean, I think I think every facet of life, I mean, how people communicate, um, how people get their news, how connected people are to their friends, the kinds of friends that they have, are they geographically dictated like they were in the early era of, of social media or are they discovering friendships in, in Discord servers or subreddits? Um, you know, the meaning of, of those relationships is really interesting to me, um, as well as how people earn income, um, you know, new digitally native jobs being formed that we, we never would have thought of years ago, whether it's, um, you know, YouTuber or TikToker or, or Discord community manager yeah. um, or, you know, all, all sorts of new jobs are created. And so I think every facet is, is really a new creation. And, um, you know, I certainly spend a lot of time trying to meet younger people to learn from them because... I think as a consumer investor, a lot of the investments we're making are companies that will realize their potential five, 10, 15 years down the road. And um, this cohort of, of people that we're investing in or who are the consumers of the products are um, going to be the lion's share of, of the customer base. And we can learn a lot mm -hmm. from them. And I often uh, am shocked by how few consumer investors will you know, join, have ever used a Discord server or have ever, you know, been on Reddit um, or don't yeah. have to talk on their phone. So, you know, I think I joke that uh, it's a, a privilege to get to consume TikTok as part of my education um, as an investor. But uh, 
I think there's a lot that can be learned by exposing yourself to younger people. So, like the the thing that um, sort of sticks out for me, or, or, or that you you basically quite recently wrote this sort of two part um, that the characteristics that define. Gen Z piece that really kind of attempted to pin down what it is about the the characteristics and behaviours that are sort of different from generations before, which basically felt like on some level it's uh, it's written as a, as a close observer, so a sort of borderline member of the cohort, but it's also like for, you know certainly the way I read it was like if you w- want to understand this generation that's going to shape the world, then you need to kind of think deeply about what it is that that's driving them and not you know often times young people like the, the kind of cliche way of us relating to of, of older cohorts relation, relating to them as to kind of dismiss or, or reduce them and yet Lucy you've written about the way that like the fandom of teenage girls in particular is often like written off when it in fact it has all these extraordinary benefits to them and can often be predictive of you know, coming cultural trends and so on. You know, what, what are some of those those traits that you think are most important to, to sort of understand about what's what's driving this kind of cultural change that is expressed in, in Gen Z? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is is what you just alluded to of um, thinking from a first principle standpoint. Um, so one of the, the reasons I wanted to write that piece on social constructs was I think we're at this unique moment in time where a new generation is coming of age, um, it's an internet native generation. We've had the, the shock of the pandemic, which is a near-term shock, but also these sort of decades-long tailwinds of, of coming of age, generational change. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting time to revisit a lot of the norms that we take for granted. Um, and you know, I think about this a lot. You know, I spent a lot of time with, with my family and my partner's family during the pandemic. Um, and you know, he and I are young enough where we often will have conversations with older adults and kind of question the way things are. And a lot of the time, older family members say, oh, but that's the way it's always been. And I think anytime you hear that's the way it's always been, it's an interesting question to say, but should it be that way? Um, And I think, you know, I'm sure down the road, I will be the one more kind of accustomed to the way things are. But um, I think that healthy skepticism, you see it in the best entrepreneurs that foresee a future where, you know, we stay in strangers' homes or get in strangers' cars or these kind of absurd things that you, when someone pitches you Airbnb or Uber, you say, that's crazy. That's not how the world works. Um, we stay in hotels, but often those are the most world changing companies. Um, so I've always been fascinated with this, with this concept. You know, I think, um, social constructs are all around us when we start looking, um, you know, whether it's the five day work week, which believe it or not, was only started in the U S in 1932. So it's less than a hundred years old, but it sort of dictates our lives now. Um, or whether it's gender, which, you know, I'm particularly passionate about and and believe is quite manufactured. You know, pink was actually considered a, uh, boy's color until, you know, the 1950s or so when JFK and Eisenhower, um, and their first ladies started to, to shift that norm. So long story short, I think it's this skepticism where you start to ask questions. We can dig into where that comes from, but, you know, it's this idea that, wait a second, society doesn't necessarily need to be this way that we've become used to. Let's question it and let's start forging it in a new vision. So one thing which, like, you know, a lot of the time on this podcast is, is spent me kind of trying to figure out, you know, the, the way that media consumption uh, patterns are changing and the lines between what is media, what is self-created, what is messaging, like they, they, they all feel like so blurry now in a way that it would be unimaginable to that kind of, that's the way things have always been type person that you were, um, you know, referring to earlier. Certainly for me, it's over the last six months, but it's probably been happening longer. There was this basically long period, basically the last decade, where it, it felt like the internet had been captured, the, the the pipes had been made, and that Google and Facebook and you know these various countries, you know, like you used to see those world maps where there was like you know Google and Facebook and and so on laid out, and they 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 had that kind of immutable quality to them, and yet the way that you've been writing, and certainly the way that you've seen like the rise of TikTok and then Be Real and even things like Depop and all of these like. It feels like there's this kind of fresh, fresh flowering of a, of a new internet, and that that's coming on board. And this is setting aside Web three and all of that, that and, and what that might become. And it seems to ge- have genuinely spooked Google and and Meta as companies for the, almost for the first time, really 
ever in terms of a competitive sense. And you've got, you know, Google's just launched that Let's Internet Better campaign. Facebook is essentially destroying both its two most profitable products. Yeah. Are those companies right to be as alarmed as they appear, do you think? Well, I do think that those companies are relics of an earlier era of the internet and they need to refresh themselves to keep up. You know, it's it's been interesting to see the backlash to the Instagram update recently where, um, you know, I think this there are two factions where some people want Instagram to be more like Snapchat. Um, they want an intimate place to, to message their friends. DMs become a replacement for iMessage for younger people. Other people want Instagram to be this place which is untethered from their offline social graph and where they get to discover creators and see content more akin to TikTok. Um, and, you know, Facebook, I guess now Meta, was born in this era of social media that was much more built around your friends and, and acquaintances from your geography, your offline connections. You know, my, my college roommate, my high school friend group, um, those were the people that I was linked up with on Facebook. And now what TikTok has done, what Discord has done, uh, what Reddit is built on is this idea of interest-based social graphs that are borderless in nature. Do I think that Instagram is right to completely destroy that uh, friend graph and the intimacy that was built through, through stories and DMs by you know, forcing you into reels and, and forcing people into um, something they didn't ask for? No, I think that's speaking from a user perspective as well. It's, it's, I'm a huge TikTok consumer, and so that's not what I want Instagram to be. I want Instagram to stay Instagram and, and not necessarily be a TikTok competitor. But I do understand why they're moving this way, because how we connect with people online and the kinds of friendships that we we have is fundamentally changed. I, I agree. I also think as much as they want to be TikTok or whoever they want to be, they actually were once pretty good at being a photo sharing app. And if they want to like, and I mean, I'm not making the rules for Instagram, but I think there actually is space for still a good photo sharing app. They could maybe be that if they wanted mm -hmm. Uh, but who knows if they will. Yeah, I mean, we see Be Real almost um, filling the gap of that. Of, yeah. If you think of, of social as, I, I tend to think of it as these set of concentric circles um, with your sort of closest friends in the center, and that's iMessage and DMs and then friends and acquaintances, and then at the further the most ring, um, more strangers, which you connect with on TikTok or, or Reddit or Discord. Um, that middle ground of loose social ties and just friendships is kind of being neglected. And so mm. to your point, there might be an opportunity there. But please continue. Uh, well, no, I was going to lead into uh, another question, which Dunk sort of alluded to. Uh, first of all, you got us interested in this whole idea of the magical Web3 or the mystical Web3, maybe I should say. And it was through a piece that you wrote that used Taylor Swift to kind of help us make sense of it. Both Dunk and I are massive Swifties, one of the many things that we bond over. Um, speaking on Web3, and you can go as deep into it as you sort of like here, it has had a bit of a rough ride, uh, particularly lately. Are you still excited for this next phase of what the web could be? Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that you are both Swifties. Um, <laughs> I should have, that should have been a prerequisite. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan. And I do think it's helpful to break down Web3's potential or some of the concepts to these more tangible examples of, you know, whether it's Taylor coin or Swift coin, um, or <laughs> the relationship that we have with people. Um, you know, I think there are some really, I think, first of all, I mean, Web3 got way ahead of its skis last year. And I think there was a lot of froth. And um, it's probably a good thing that some of that exuberance is being tampered down. I think that correction was inevitable. Um, but I also think that there are some fundamentally interesting pieces about Web3 and, and blockchain in general that are uh, important. So for one, the idea that there can be scarcity in the digital world, the idea that you can have a digital unique good, that's a very powerful concept. Um, and I do think that that will prove to be a very important concept. Um, you know, I think does an NFT, you know, does a, a, a JPEG of an ape need to be hundreds of thousands of dollars? Maybe not. Um, you know, I think there are many, many questions around to what extent, but is there an interesting idea of a ticket to a Taylor Swift concert or a creator, um, you know, trading card or fandom? Could that be a non-fungible token in the future? Absolutely. 
Uh, and so I think we're going to see some use cases which are quite interesting. Mm. Um, but I also think that a lot of them will be abstracted away from, from users where Web3 will be just like we don't talk about um, something being a mobile company or a desktop company now. Uh, we don't talk about uh, AWS. We don't talk about a lot of the infrastructure behind things. I think they'll underpin things, mm -hmm. but consumers might not necessarily need to understand some of the concepts. Right. And kind of similar to that, something that always gets tossed around in the same breath as Web3 um, is the metaverse. And you wrote a really, again, I think this was the first piece I read from you. And it was about how Neopets sort of paved the way to the metaverse. <laughs> Now I, I am I am aging myself here by <laughs> talking about Neopets too. So now you you know my true age. Um, I did play Neopets as a kid. Yeah, but so. so did I. Okay, there you go, there you go. So mm -hmm. look, we do we do cross paths. I don't know if that makes you old or me young. I'm not sure. So. <laughs> I think it makes you young because <laughs> I'm not here to be called old. No, nah, kidding. kidding. <laughs> right. um, I think the metaverse is. It's unique. I think it's quite janky when you use it and sort of a little bit uninspiring, particularly when Meta has rebranded to try and take some claim on it. But maybe that's because I have something that I've heard you speak about called reality privilege. And I would like for you to explain to the people, because I thought this was a really interesting concept, one, what reality privilege is, and then two, whether you reckon Gen's, uh, Gen Zs are actually going to have the metaverse as a significant part of our future. Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, unfortunately, the word metaverse, I think, will become a bad word. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, meta now is yeah. the name, and, and Mark Zuckerberg have unfortunately co-opted it, where it will become completely associated with Facebook. <laughs> but do I think that there will be virtual spaces that are immersive, that are an important part of, of the future of the internet? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think Neopets was interesting in how it trained us for a lot of these. I mean, I remember... Um, learning HTML to build spaces in Neopets. I remember meeting strangers from around the world and, and interacting in the forums. They had a currency, you know? Exactly. <laughs> they truly, truly were sort of one of the first digital economies. Yeah. I mean, you know, now, of course, Minecraft and Roblox and Fortnite, and there are many interesting kind of virtual currencies out there, but, um, but it was quite, quite ahead of its time. And so I do think that Metaverse, it'll be interesting to see how we think of that term in 5, 10, 15 years. But I'm long-term bullish on virtual reality and augmented reality. Mm -hmm. I think that when, when they arrive and go mainstream, we will say the hype was justified just way ahead of yeah. its time. I love the Tim Sweeney, the founder of Epic Games, maker of Fortnite's quote, I've never met a skeptic of virtual reality who has tried it. I think that's a very great way to put it where... Um, you know, it truly is a very transformative and immersive experience, which which is a great conduit or um, transition into a, to reality privilege, which I think I first heard of from Mark Andreessen um, when he spoke about it. But it's this basic idea that it's easy to wring your hands and say, oh, no, you know, people spending time in the metaverse that is, um, you know, antisocial or it's bad for our physical health, et cetera, et cetera. We should be spending time in nature and in the world. And I think that's absolutely true. We, we certainly sh shouldn't replace the natural world and analog world with technology. But it's also this concept of reality privilege, which is if you're saying that you might have a very vibrant life or, or live in a very vibrant place. You know, I live in New York City. Um, not, not everyone in the world gets to live in the hub of so much art and culture. And so if you're somewhere quite isolated from people, or if you're somewhere where you can experience a Broadway show um, or can't go to a theme park or amusement park or the movie theater, then it's actually, you know, the vibrancy of your life might be more complete in the metaverse. The experiences that you can have in virtual reality will be um, much more accessible from an economic perspective um, and a convenience perspective than experiences that you have in your hometown. So I think it's a really powerful concept mm -hmm. that kind of reframes um, I don't want to list any places because I, I don't want the like person from Kansas. Now I did list places to <laughs> like, be like, you know, what's wrong with Kansas? But, you know, I think there are a lot of places in the in the world that are objectively um, less of a clash of humanity and culture uh, than other places. And so virtual spaces will have a gap to fill there. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think this, this, that's such an interesting thought. I mean, the, 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 it, I feel this weird tension with the metaverse. It's, 
on one level, it's become like a totally toxic name, thanks to Meta. In the same way that weirdly, like, you know, Web Web three has the hype cycle to becoming completely unmentionable thing is working very fast at the moment. But the thing about the metaverse that does excite me is, is what you alluded to. It's, you know, you, you've talked about this this move to a more kind of community like a borderless community oriented uh, relationships rather than geographically bound ones. And, you know, on some level, the idea that, you know, you can work and relate to people in a much more kind of tangible rather than screen mediated way than, you know, th- through an immersive environment that that sort of rings, you know, right to me. And, and, you know, you look at the the cost of living and the you know homelessness and in, in some of America's biggest cities, and you think about how being able to kind of, leaving some of that by making the work accessible from from anywhere beyond a sort of Slack and Zoom type kind of hybrid that that, that feels like it's also potentially enabled by it. Uh, I just want to kind of pivot a little bit from from a sort of future state thing to something that's very present but also feels weirdly ignored by the sort of more quote-unquote traditional media like, like us, which is the creator economy. And you've written a lot about that with a real kind of, and I think you, you have a lot of excitement about the kinds of jobs that it's opening up. I read um, the published press yesterday, another great newsletter about that, and they just sort of casually had this ad for Mr. Beast, who's hiring 20 people, he's got 20 open positions right now, which is the kind of number for that, you know, like a quite a well-funded startup would ordinarily have. And this is the, a single creator. And that just kind of blew my mind in terms of like, that sort of scaled employment at, at that point. Like, what's going on in the creator economy, and how do you sort of see that evolving over time? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll use Mr. Beast as the transition point there because he is signed with Night Media, and I think it was a chart from Night Ventures that I saw that I thought encapsulated the shift best, which was basically, you know, if we think of where trust and excitement in America was in the 1950s, it, it was with institutions. So the U.S. government, um, you know, we went to the moon in the 60s. The most trusted people in America were the president. Um, people wanted to grow up and be astronauts or senators, presidents. Um, and then it shifted to corporations. And so in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we went through this corporate America transformation where the people that we idolized were, um, you know, Warren Buffett and, um, you know, the the big kind of Jack Welch at um, General Electric and these sort of titans of industry. Uh, And that continued with, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and up to sort of present day. But we're now shifting from this trust of corporations where people dreamed of being a CEO to now it's really focused on individuals. And, And so I think this shift of power to individuals is one of the biggest trends of our generation. And we see it everywhere. We see it in People wanting to be freelancers, um, a huge increase in self-employment, um, in business creation, both small businesses um, as well as entrepreneurship and venture-backed businesses. You know, we see it in the creator economy, but it's really this incredible um, shift of power. And I think the people that are young today, you see all the surveys that say, "I want to be, grow up and be a YouTuber. I want to be a blogger. I want to be a TikToker." Um, it's a really interesting phenomenon, but. I think what it is is that people see a lot of um, distrust in institutions and corporations from many different events. I mean, the Great Recession, the pandemic now, um, some of the the government issues that we've had in America. And they say, I'd rather take matters into my own hand, dictate my own fortunes. Um, And that's powering a lot of the creator economy. I think it's really interesting that um, you bring up the surveys about young people wanting to be YouTubers and vloggers and influencers because I think when I was growing up, we wanted to do that. At high school, lots of people wanted to be influencers and vloggers because they thought you could get perks, you could get sent free stuff, you could travel for a living. But now I think it's shifted to like what you said is that we want to be these self-made and self-employed people and in these jobs, not because of the perks, but because of a shift in, you know, how we feel about institutions. We sort of reject the five-day work week and think if we could do something, you know, 12 hours a day for three days, we could get it all done and, you know, have a longer weekend or whatever. I just think it's interesting that even with me and my friends or the people that I've watched around me, we still want the same outcome of being self-employed, but we want it not because of perks, but like you said, because 
we don't want to maybe work for the man anymore. Mm. It's just real interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly right. And I think when I think creator economy, I think much broader than just the, the Instagram influencer mm. or, or person making TikTok videos. Um, you know, I think of it, I often think of it more even beyond creative work of sort of the self-employed economy or even internet native work economy mm. of this idea that, you know, I, I met a, a young person the other day who makes a living, um, building sneaker bots, you know, he builds bots that he then sells online and people use them more investors in, in goat, um, the sneaker marketplace. And so, you know, people, when the next Yeezys are coming out and they want to buy sneakers, they could use his bot. Another of my friends is building a digital product, a bot right now for, um, reservations for open table and resi here in New York, basically, you know, he'll sell the spot to people and then they can scoop up the coveted reservations at restaurants. And it's really interesting where, you know, they might list to this somewhere on the internet. Maybe they'll post about it in a discord server or subreddit, and then they'll earn passive income. And this isn't exactly what we think of when we think of the creator economy. Um, you know, it's not them posting sponsored posts on Instagram for one-off flat rates um, or trying to earn peanuts from the TikTok creator fund. It's them creating this product on the internet and then basically, you know, earning income in their sleep as people use their bot. And so I think these are really creative ways that people are learning to be fluent in the internet, to find new careers that didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago even. And I think that's the future where the jobs that people will have will just continue to be more creative and innovative. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. We spent a lot of this podcast, and, and certainly it's it's a consuming passion of yours to, to sort of view the kind of edge cases of the present and imagine the future through that. And you know, here, here in New Zealand, we um, you know we have a, a sort of a public media system which is very much still like you know if if you were to kind of rationally examine it, it's really still built around behaviours that were kind of last you know the norm in in like say sort of 2005 it's linear television and it's uh and it's radio fm radio and they've gone online but that's the sort of basically just cutting up and putting the thing there as opposed to anything much more profound than that. and that's been a budget bound thing and i what we've just done uh here is basically decided to merge those entities which you know in the us would be like merging a sort of pbs and an npr and to, we've given them more budget. And the reason that they've done that is because, and this is a surprise to no one, that young people and particularly diverse communities are just not engaging with these products, not just in their original kind of linear type uh, formats, but basically anywhere. And the thing which, which strikes me, you know, when I read what you're sort of writing and, t and saying about Gen Z is that it doesn't feel like, you know, with that shift away from institutions and towards individuals and the sort of splintering of uh, consumption habits around media anyway, that, you know, it feels like a, a bold bet to say that you could build almost any institution and have young people kind of gravitate towards it. What is your perspective on that? Do you think, you know, just as a, as a baseline, the idea of a 
of a big new institution can win back that audience? Or do you think that the ship has sailed there? I mean, I certainly don't think scale is the answer. Um, I do think I, I could buy the argument that scale gives those networks better resources through which they can invest in new channels. But I really think it's where are the eyeballs and it's getting to where the puck is going, which is, you know, thinking about whether it's a TikTok strategy or what's the next great um, platform where where folks will be the next medium. You know, I think some some companies have done well. I mean, here in the U.S., the Washington Post is very creative on TikTok. They have um, an individual who has become the face of their TikTok, and I think they've really humanized the brand. And so I think the, the broader issue is that a lot of corporations are stuck in the sort of 20th century talking points of communicating with, with viewers, with customers. And you've seen, you know, companies kind of reinvent themselves on, uh, you know, Wendy's comes to mind on Twitter, <laughs> yeah. their Twitter, I don't know if you've seen it, is pretty outlandish. Um, recently, Radio Shack. Radio yeah, Shack, right. my God. Right. Yeah, I mean, what's going on? And that one's a little too far. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you know. I'm at work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we, you can't soft talk about porn, it. it yeah. It's not even particularly soft porn. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's certainly, you know, and they have a new owner and they're going into crypto and it's, it's an interesting story. But, you know, Chipotle is probably a great example of a company that has done really authentic partnerships with creators and has really kind of creative um, TikTok challenges like the lid flip challenge. And, um, you know, so I think that scale might help invest those, reinvest those resources, but Really, it's thinking about talking to young people, um, thinking about where they are. And I think every I'm always fascinated by marketing and, and what channels work and how you sort of create viral moments. Um, but I think every company should be having a, a strategy around TikTok and around Gen Z and, and reaching younger people where they're at. I mean, the, the, the issue I sometimes have with that is like I, I get it on the idea that, you know, that is where the fish are. But if you're a, a you know, sort of a, a private business, which, you know, for example, um, we are, uh, at the, at the spinoff, there's part of me that's like, I, I understand that the audience is there. I understand that it's, uh, you know, that it's, if we want to be present on TikTok, we have to be there. I just don't see a way that the sort of scale of traditional media can monetize there in anything like a way that might, you know, monetizing on TikTok is notoriously hard at the moment for creators. And TikTok's doing quite well, but it doesn't have a YouTube-like revenue share model that is particularly working. You know, and, and also, Washington Post aside, a lot of the time when you see traditional media there, and it's, you know, unless you find that creator who can truly embody your brand, it can feel pretty cringe, but also it's a place that sort of tolerates cringe in a, in a weird way. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I guess... <laughs> like, well, that Me one right now, t- tolerating cringe? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I feel like it's most of our relationship. <laughs> um, but, I mean, ultimately, like... Is, it, is this just because it's nascent that it hasn't matured into a place where there is a kind of a, a way of you know, creating income out of it? Or is it just sort of fundamental to the platform that it is more Instagram-like in the way that you, you make your money off, off platform and sort of express, the, express it through reach on there? I mean, I think creator monetization and just monetization of the large social platforms is one of the most interesting challenges out there and one of the biggest investment opportunities. The way I think about it, I mean... As a creator, I see two real archetypes of uh, sustainable income. One is the sort of Instagram influencer or quote unquote influencer. And and, uh, I don't love that term. Um, I think it very much embodies the 2010s um, sort of era of curated performative social media, which I definitely was part of (laughs) um, and which I grew up in. Um, But, you know, I think it's it's past its prime and certainly not Gen Z. I like what uh, our investors in Patreon and Jack Conti, the founder, likes to say that, um, you know, inf- influencer as a term pulls out of creators the one thing that advertisers care about, influence. And he's like, I don't wake up every morning to influence. I wake up to create. But I actually think the term fits well for the sponsored post economy, which is a multi-billion dollar economy built on companies like Instagram. So I think that's one viable way. And then the other is really long form revenue on YouTube. YouTube is really the moneymaker for most creators still. It's, they share AdSense with you. Um, there are sort of multiple levers you can pull there and build a sustainable business. So those are the two kind of uh, two archetypes that I see. And I think short form video is uniquely challenging to monetize because it's like, how do I attribute an ad you know, when it was in between 
Rex and Lucy's, you know, video. Yeah. None um, taken. Yeah. <laughs> and you too. You're, you're there too. Um, but, but uh, you know, you know, but uh, it cringes in. But no, no. I mean, I think it is a uniquely challenging problem. And, um, you know, right now I think TikTok very much acts as top of funnel where you have to drive conversion monetization later on. So, you know, it's much more akin to Coca-Cola advertising where they don't care about conversion. They care about um, you know, brand awareness of so the next time you're at the movie theater and you see Coke and Pepsi, you choose Coke. Because of that Kendall Jenner Pepsi ad. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Don't even get me started. <laughs> but yeah, maybe that's why you choose Coke. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a good strategy. Anti marketing. <laughs> but, you know, I think it is interesting where, you know, it's much harder for a D2C brand that really needs outcomes. Um, and wants to convert to you know to acquire paying customers um, to use that as a channel, and so you know I think that'll be an interesting problem to to be solved. But I also think it creates a huge opportunity of there are all of these people w- that have aggregated enormous amounts of um, enormous sort of eyeballs, and how do we translate that into sustainable income? And I think that's going to be one of the bigger stories of the next decade. I think you led perfectly into a question I really wanted to ask you there when you were talking about how we used to, you know, perform on Instagram and curate it. And you have said that we were sort of in the decade of status and that was when we all flexed on Maine. Um, And now we're in the decade of community where we're all being authentic on Maine and we're like... I don't know, like you said, using Discord and Reddit and, I mean, I use a newsletter to make sure that I'm as in touch as I can possibly be with these gorgeous people that are choosing to read what I write and support me. What do you think, this is a big question, what do you think is next? What do you think is after the decade of community? Oh, man, that's a tough one because I think uh, what is after community? I mean, it's almost... uh, an apocalyptic question. But almost fucked. <laughs> I mean, I think the answer is more community, more more depth. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think that um, you know, we are I like to point to Discord's kind of 19, I think there are 19 million weekly active servers mm-hmm. on Discord, which I think illustrates the breadth of the internet where everyone can find someone who's uh, interesting and interested, um, and shares their interests, you know, and Jack at Patreon puts it another way where he says, you know, in your small town, you might feel left out because none of the thousand people there share the same interests as mm-hmm. you, but you know, that one in a thousand, and there are four and a half billion people online. That means there are four and a half million people who have that same very niche interest as you. And so I think what we're going to see is just more discovery of layers and layers of depth in those communities. I mean, still right now, it's we're getting better. We've seen, you know, AI driven feeds like TikTok show us better what we uh, are interested in. We're, you know, getting suggested uh, subreddits and Discord servers. But I think just three layers deep of niche is where Mm. the world is going. And it turns out that those niches are often a lot bigger than any of us thought. And I love it. I love the move. Maybe it's the move from not these huge audiences. Even for us, we have a huge Instagram audience, but our micro audience or our smaller audience in the newsletter is one where I feel the safest and the most heard. And two, where even organizations that want to work with us, they're going away from just wanting this huge number of, I don't know, just a whole lot of people to people they know are really interested and invested. So maybe, yeah, it's the decade of smaller communities and yeah and from an influencer marketing perspective i mean i think brands care a lot more about uh ability to drive conversion especially in this market downturn than they do about just touching vanity metrics like impressions exactly or followers so i think there's going to be a huge shift to affiliate marketing um conversion-based campaigns um i think one of the most interesting problems to address right now uh, is the CAC headwind of you know Facebook and Google that pretty much every company is facing. And so it's kind of like if those channels are in, untenable, where else can I go? What other channels can I create or invent or double down mm-hmm. on? And there's a lot of innovation to, to be created there to make sure that growth can still happen in this environment. Yeah, I think it, it feels like there was a kind of a converging into very large things, and that was you know the the story of the last decade. And now it's it's a massive splintering across almost any metric you care to name, and and that is you know fundamentally to what is going to be so challenging for institutions to to grapple with is just that everyone was trained on on mass, and now mass is gone, and it's never coming back, and that's just a really hard thing. 
Yeah. And I mean, to your point, Duncan, on, on networks, I mean, maybe the answer is that those mega networks don't exist in the future, right? Which I think um, certainly has a lot of uh, cultural ripple effects in that if we think about this kind of cohesive cultural language that we used to have, because here in the US, we had three television channels and you know everyone watched Walter Cronkite um, and then everyone watched MASH and I Love Lucy and uh, Roots and these sort of shared cultural touchstones. And I think it's interesting to think about is that sustainable in the future? And when news fragments, when um, our friendships fragment, when you know we're inundated with so much content, what does that do to us as a society when we lack that kind of common foundation? Yeah, I, I think about that all the time. That you know, that sense of you know, I think about people like Drake and Taylor Swift as the, almost like the last stars of of the true mass era, and now. The, you know, even someone like an Olivia Rodrigo, who's got like incredible cut through, but it's quite possible that your mum would not have heard of her. But in the same way that you you know, you could guarantee that because of the way that culture used to be distributed, they definitely have heard of, of Taylor Swift or mm-hmm. or Drake. And uh, you know, naturally, as a as an old dude, I, I sort of mourn that era. But I think for for the sort of institutional kind of thing, like. There was part of me that was like, is the best thing for the government to do just to employ New Zealand's top 500 TikTokers and then just have like a 50 person promotion relegation on an annualized basis? And it's the most mercenary, dystopian thing in the world, but it also might po- possibly be the most sort of effective uh, way, way of just ensuring reach. But there's all kinds of, anyway, this is a kind of. <laughs> test up. and learn. We should yeah. test that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm like, I, I just don't know. We, I think we just have to be open to some really weird stuff happening. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time, which I've enjoyed so much and I really appreciate it. And I wanted to kind of. To, to return to something you touched on earlier and have been writing about lately, which is um, you've, you, you've written a two-part series called, called Like Water, which makes reference to a, a David Wallace Wells commencement speech, which is basically about the things that are around us all the time that we essentially don't notice are there. And they're almost like the things that are potentially most able to be disrupted. I wonder, given that it'll be fresh in your mind, what, maybe picking one or two of those that you feel are most ripe um, for disruption or, or that you're seeing things now which you sense are going to come and, and sort of change, change the world much the same way that like an Uber or, or an, an Airbnb did, uh, you know, to, to your examples earlier. Yeah, I mean, I think the most obvious um, and immediate one just from the pandemic certainly is remote work. Um, mm. And I think that's going to shift a lot of the societal fabric that's been built around the relationships that we have um, with coworkers, certainly, but but friends and family as well. And so, this idea of you know working in an office every day, um, I think, will be looked back on as a remnant of of the 20th century. And um, I actually just saw earlier today. I was looking at a chart that uh, maps who we spend time with as we age. And so, you know, our time with our partner peaks later in life during retirement, our time with our family uh, declines and uh, par- parents, especially as we leave home. But the most interesting part to me was that the time that we spend with our coworkers is about three times the amount of time that we spend with our family and about four or five times the amount of time that we spend with our friends. And I always think, you know, when you think from first principles, does it make sense that I'm having lunch with Janet from accounting, who I have nothing in common with. We're like sitting in the corporate cafeteria, you know, making small talk when I could be having lunch with my partner um, or with our kids, with my aging parents. I think it's a really powerful concept. I mean, I think that'll dictate happiness a lot. You know, there are many, many studies of commutes being directly linked to unhappiness. And so I wrote in this piece, I, I feel kind of bad for people who are just retiring now, who commuted for an hour a day, you know, from Connecticut into New York, into Manhattan for, you know, 40 or 50 years, when you add it up, that's three or four years of their life spent commuting. And I feel lucky to be sort of in an earlier age in my career where I I turned to my partner during the pandemic and said, the amount of time that we'll spend with our future kids just went way up as dads. So I think, you know, it's a really interesting shift. I think there are many sort of interesting investing theses behind that. We're lucky to be investors in Figma and Notion and Slack and a lot of the iconic kind of collaboration software companies. I think there are going to be many more that become household names. You know, I think asynchronous work with companies like Loom will emerge. Um, I think companies that can build that kind of cohesive 
company culture when people are remote. Um, we're investors in a company called Gather, where you can actually build a digital kind of footprint of your office and, and use spatial audio and video to, to walk around it and interact with colleagues. I think those will be really interesting. So this was a long-winded way where I spent way too much time on the first of the, your question was two, but I'll pause there because I think that's probably the most timely right now and I think will shape a lot of our culture. I think you showed some beautiful optimism. The way that you turned to your partner and said, you know, our time with our future kid just went way up is that's the way that, that's why I love your writing is because I never feel doom and gloom after hearing about <laughs> something that was inherently so shit like the pandemic. And then you can turn and say, well, actually, this was a huge upside and it can be if we just look, in it, look at it in the right way. Also, I can't believe I've never thought about the fact that your time with your coworkers goes way up and the time with your family goes way down. It's a very basic thing that I should have considered. Yeah, I mean, you can't pick your family. And we kind of just take it for granted, right? Yeah. We just say that's how life is. Yeah. Like I, I depart work for work at 7 or 8 a.m. I come back at 5 or 6 p.m. I get an hour with my kids before they go to bed. And yeah. I spend 17 hours, you know, or seven hours a day or eight hours a day with, you know, coworkers, which I'm lucky that I like. A lot of people do not like yeah. their coworkers. I think um, it's a huge, <laughs> huge change to be able to work from home and yeah. in between, uh, your meetings, be able to see your partner or kids. Totally agree. And um, honestly, like if, if you uh, if you're listening and you, you've enjoyed uh, the, this conversation, I could not recommend uh, Digital Native Rex's newsletter uh, highly enough. Do you, do you want to just give it a, a quick plug and tell people where to find it? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um. Thank you for that. It's at digitalnative.substack.com. Um, my Twitter is Rex underscore Woodbury. It's it's also linked there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically sending out weekly thoughts, usually on, on a single topic, but it always broadly relates to the intersection of technology and culture and consumer behavior, Gen Z, a lot of the topics that we're talking about. So no, appreciate you. It always up for feedback on my blind spots as well from you two and others on uh, what are interesting topics or companies to, to dig into. Um, Cause I always learn best from crowdsourcing that kind of insight. Lucy's is really good at giving you feedback on on your blind spots and, and failings as a person. So you know, glad to have introduced you. Good. Um, no, thanks so much, Rex. This has been incredible and have been anticipating a long time. Huge, huge fans here, and yeah, thanks so much for coming on the fold. Thank you both. Looking forward to the next one. The fold was brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network, together with Daylight. It was hosted by Duncan Grieve. Produced by T.I. Hair Butler, with production management by Rachel Maru and series production by Jane Yee. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. K-pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The spin-off's new documentary, k Polys follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K-pop. In a one-off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. When you start dressing, looking different, everyone side-eyes you. But in K-pop, they're just like, no, like, celebrate yourself. Watch k Polys today at thespinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.